So what I want to do is kind of walk through six or seven things that Generation Z has told us how to reach their generation. So almost this topic is really, which I love and excited about, it's how to reach Generation Z in their own words. It's them telling us how to see them, if that makes sense, all right? So let's kind of walk through that. I'm going to, if I can here, I'm going to share my screen with you, and I'm going to walk through kind of like a PowerPoint presentation that we shared. And then after each point, we'll kind of discuss each one. All right, so let me share my screen here with you. So maybe that you can see this. All right. All right. Okay. So let me, let me try to move this here. Where did, where did that go? All right, here we go. All right. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Can everybody see my screen okay? All right, cool. All right, I'll come back to these things at the end. These are some free resources for you. Let me come those to the end. All right, so things we need to know about reaching Generation Z with the gospel in their own words. All right, number, uh, the first thing I wanna share is this, is everything that's being said about the current next generation are the exact same things that were said about every other generation, all right? So I wanna encourage you with this, all right? So what are some things that are said currently about Generation Z? Uh, Non-committal, mainly about themselves, uh, you know, they're, um, you know they're, they're kind of flighty all over the map, um, uh, you know, they, uh, they're really uh, more about self-fulfillment. Here's the deal. All those things have also been said about previous generations. Let me read two quotes for you real quick. The now generation has become the me generation. How many of you agree that's almost sounds exactly what is said about Generation Z or millennials, right? The now generation has become the me generation. Check this out. This was written in a New York Times article in 1976 describing baby boomers when they were teenagers. All right. Listen to this quote. They have trouble making decisions. They would rather hike the, Himalaya, hike the Himalayas than climb a corporate ladder. They crave entertainment, but their attention span is as short as one zap of a TV dial. They postpone marriage because they dread divorce. That was written in Time Magazine in 1990 about Generation X, all right? So on three, I want us all to take a deep breath, all right? I'm gonna count to three and just take a deep breath. Ready? One, two, three. <sighs> Here's the deal. Everything that has been said about the generation you're working with or everything that's been said about you, all right, and your generation are the exact same things that have been said about all the previous generations. I think there's just something to be said about being young and dumb. Would you agree with that? But there's also something to be said about being old and dumb. Does anybody feel like the older you get, you still make dumb decisions? right? We still fall on our face. Meaning this, there's something to be said about human nature. There's something to be said about a sin nature. Here's the deal, is when we throw around terms like baby boomers, or generation X, or millennials, or Gen Z, I want you to realize this, the Bible does not recognize those terms. You will not find the term baby boomer between Genesis and Revelation. The only reason we have those terms is because those are man-made terms. Culture made those up. And so we don't want definitions to determine how we view people. We want the word of God to determine how we view people. Like Because the Bible only recognizes people who are made in God's image, that desperately need the gospel, that God loves, and desperately need to be discipled. Um, if we're not careful, we will allow culture to define how we see a generation. And we need to let the word of God define how we see a generation. All right. Um, okay. So point number one, real quick, and then we'll discuss this one. All right. Number one, Generation Z. Let me just say this real quick. Uh, I meant to say this earlier. When I talk about Generation Z, there's all kind of different definitions. When I talk about Generation Z, I'm referring mainly to those who are in college right now or high school students, junior high students, preteens. So that's kind of how I define in Generation Z right now. All right, cool. All right, number one, Generation Z want to be seen as people 
and not projects. Meaning this, Generation Z has a, a unique ability to see right through agendas. Meaning this, like if we preach a gospel wrapped in agendas, they will see right through that. In fact, we know according to the New Testament, like Galatians and Colossians and some of those, that a gospel wrapped in agenda is not the gospel anyway, right? And so what I mean by that, let me say this, uh, let me just throw this snake in the pit. We can discuss it more. If we're not careful, um, especially in the South, what we'll often do is we'll present the gospel this way. We would never say it with our mouths, but sometimes our actions show it that almost we present the gospel this way. You need to surrender to Jesus and, re and join this political party. Listen, that's not the gospel. That's a gospel wrapped in agendas. And a gospel wrapped in agendas will repel a generation. Like Jesus is our agenda. And so we must see people and not projects. Also, we got to ask ourselves, I think on a daily basis, why do we reach the next, why do we want to reach the next generation? So when I'm coaching, uh, coaching conventions or associations or uh, consulting with local churches, that's always my first question when they say, hey, we want to reach the next generation. Help us think through that. The question is, why do you want to reach the next generation? Meaning this, like if your primary motivation to reach the next generation is so that you'll be the cool church in town or seen as the relevant church in town or the trendy church in town, that is the wrong motivation. Um, or what about this? If your main motivation to reach the next generation is to extend the life of your local church, uh, as kindly as I can say this, uh, that's not the right motivation. Meaning this, often when I ask this question, especially to local churches, by far the number one answer I get is this. If we don't reach the next generation, then our church won't exist in five years or our church won't exist in 10 years. Or, um, you know, we, we won't be able to continue to operate and pay our budget. Listen, that is not the right motivation of reaching the next generation. Our main motivation as the local church to reach the next generation cannot be so our church's name can continue to exist or our church's logo or so that we can fulfill the obligations of our budget. Our main motivation to reach the next generation must be because they are people made in the image of God, that God loves them. They desperately need the gospel. That is why we're here as the church to advance the gospel and that they desperately need to be discipled. And here's what I promise you. If you're about reaching people, if you're about sharing the gospel, if you're about dunking people in the name of Jesus and you're about making disciples, then all those other things will take care of themselves, like the life of your church, uh, God providing the resources. So what is our main motivation for reaching the next generation? It can't be to see them as projects. It must be to see them as people, meaning you see them the way God does. All right. First one out there would love any thoughts on that comments questions criticisms critiques any discussion on that before we move on to the next one man i think uh i'll, I'll just jump in here real quick uh i think that's yeah. fantastic is is the agenda um they see through it uh i, I was reading an article that gen z uh on average i don't, I don't know the the exact uh statistics but that uh generation z sees more ads than uh in in visual representations of things than uh in in one week than than most of mankind had in their entire lifetime wow you know like they see so many advertisements so many things telling them you need this you need this you need this and uh you know if we are uh, if the local church is presenting um, our, if we're presenting ourselves as another ad, as another agenda of like, hey, come, come be a part of our club. Um, now we obviously want them to become part of the family of God, but uh, but I think it's spot on. They see agendas because they see so many advertisements, they see so many things on the internet that they can spot something fake, you know, a mile away. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree 100%, John. In fact, when you, especially with a young adult, college student, high school student, when you ask uh, 
one of them, why don't, why don't they go to church or why don't they follow Jesus, uh, the ones that are unchurched? Very rarely does it have anything to do with the Bible. Very rarely does it have anything to do with scientific reasons. It's usually uh, some point of hypocrisy they point out or some area where they've been hurt or just some area where they see uh, our message uh, doesn't reflect the message of the Bible or they see our life does not reflect the message we preach. Yeah, I mean, I agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Shane, what's up, man? So I hey, serve. Hey, Matt. Good seeing you, bud. Yeah, yeah, I can see you too. Uh, I serve with preteens and I feel like um, a lot of times it's like, hey, come to this event. Um, yeah. This is our preteen version of D-Now. This is our uh, Adventure Week, our VBS. This is our camp. When you come to these uh, amazing ministry events, you're going to be discipled. Uh, you're going to hear the gospel and have an opportunity to come to faith in Christ. Uh, however, um, you know, we are advertising programs uh, for the sake of their discipleship, for the sake of their uh, salvation. Um, we don't want to sell them anything other than Jesus. So how do you balance that without seeming like, oh, they're just trying to get me to go to stuff. But ultimately, we want you to go to stuff so that you can come to know Christ and be, desi be discipled and get plugged into the local church and you can bring your friends and so on and so forth. Yeah, man, that's great, man. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, the last thing, that any of us, no matter what our age is, we don't want to be sales pitched. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Um, and so I think the best way to do that often is, uh, Matt, is, is really through uh, celebration, meaning this, like, celebrate the right wins. And when you're celebrating stories, then people go, oh, here's the why. Here's the why I should come to the building for this. Here's the why I should be a part of this. Meaning this, um, my mentor told me this whenever I was a senior pastor of a church, and gosh, I saw it. He said this, whatever we celebrate the most is what we're intentionally or unintentionally discipling our people to believe is most important. So let's be honest. What do we usually celebrate the most? Nickels and noses, right? We celebrate attendance. We celebrate how many. We celebrate the giving, the offering, the budget. So when that is the constant thing we're celebrating, that's what we're discipling our people to believe is most important. If we really say that discipleship is most important and evangelism is most important and missional living is most important, then those are the stories we should celebrate more than any other. You know what I mean? And so, man, when one of your preteeners, like if you hear a story of how they shared their faith with somebody, even if that person didn't accept, right? Because salvation is up to the Lord. Uh, obedience is what we're called to. So, man, if you hear that, celebrate that, you know, with permission, make a testimony video of that, celebrate that. Because what that does is that it says, oh, what we're doing here is important. And numbers, you know, it's not bad to celebrate numbers uh, when numbers are tied to souls, because soul, God cares about souls, right? And stories. And so celebrating just stories, celebrating what God's doing, and it does two things. Number one, it makes people see, oh, this is really important what we're doing. And I think even a 10-year-old can understand that. And then the second thing it does is that, you know, 10-year-old, 15-year-old, 20-year-old, 50-year-old, they expect us as leaders to share things and share about what we're doing and how God's using us. Or they expect us to preach and teach. But then when one of their peers do it, they go, wait a minute, right? Like my 13-year-old, uh, she expects to hear her youth pastors talk. But then when her 14-year-old friend shares a testimony or devotional, she's like, wait a minute. If she can do it, I can do it. You know what I mean? That's an attention grabber. So I think what you celebrate, what you put in front of them. Um, to me, I always say that a vision is a better motivator than guilt is, right? As the church, we're usually guilting, right? You need to come to this if people don't show up, we're not going to do it. Or you need to give. If you don't give, then we can't do ministry. And a lot of times that's more guilt motivated. Uh, if we cast a compelling vision, then people want to be a part of that. And all those other things fall into place. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Shane. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Hey, let's move on to the next one. And we'll take some more comments and uh, questions as it goes through here. I'm really excited about this next point, And I definitely see it in every generation, but I really see it in the next generation, which I'm so excited about. 
uh, and it's uh, this point right here, number two, uh, Generation Z are not ageist. Now, what I mean by that is this. Um, I don't think they care how old we are, and they don't care how old their leaders are. Typically, we think, man, to reach the next generation, then we need to get somebody just a tad bit older, somebody really cool, you know, somebody with some sleeve tattoos, some skinny jeans that has a mad shoe game. Listen, if that's your style, be you. But I'm saying is, it doesn't take that. Really what it takes is someone being themselves and that has a heart for the next generation. In fact, uh, we'll talk about this in a, in a moment. The next generation cares deeply about authenticity. So if you're trying to be something or dress like some, something or someone you're not, they'll see right through that. That's a turnoff, right? So be you. Hey, I love, I'm a sneakerhead, all right? You may not be. Be you. The next generation is, are not ages, meaning this. They don't care how old you are. They just want to care that, first of all, you're being honest. And then second of all, that you care about them. That's what they care about. Do you care about them? Um, meaning one of the most beautiful pictures I've ever seen of this was about three months ago, four months ago. I was traveling to preach somewhere in another state, got there early, went to the Starbucks next to the, uh, the facility where the, the, the event was and was in there just early kind of praying and get my mind right, just kind of uh, taking a break. And, and I look over and there's a guy probably in his mid to late 70s um, and sitting at a table with him are three college age guys and all four of them have their Bible open. And I looked at that and I go, that's Titus chapter two, the older men taking the younger men, the older women taking the younger women. Um, like, I think that sometimes we do ourselves a disservice when we uh, make everything age specific. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, of course, we see the value in age specific ministries. That's why we, we all exist. That's why we're here. We see the value of that. But what I'm saying is, I think we would also do ourselves some favors if we can do more multi-generational ministry together, more multi-generation mission trips together, more multi-generation serving together. Um, because when we say, hey, all the kids, you go over here, uh, all the teenagers, you go over here, all the young singles, you go over here, all the young marrieds go over here, all the young families with young kids, you go over here, all the empty nesters, you go over here. Uh, you know, we don't say senior adults anymore. That's offensive. So, hey, all you classics, you go over here, right? And we separate everybody. I think we cut out our discipleship legs out from under us. I think we need the multi-generation, meaning this, older generations can learn from the next generation. And the next generation can definitely learn from the older generation. Um, in fact, whenever I was a student pastor, our most popular volunteer leaders were senior adults. Because sometimes, and I, I remember this as a teenager, sometimes, especially as a teenager or college student, you identify sometimes more with your grandparents than you even do your parents. You know what I mean? Um, and so here's, let me throw this kind of bomb out and then we can discuss it. I think one of the most untapped resources in any local church for next gen ministries are the senior adults. And here's why I say that. Most senior adults, they're retired, so they have wide open calendars. They have uh, a lot of wisdom to offer. Um, they have a lot of life experiences. Um, a lot of them are financially stable. And then lastly, a lot of them have grit and they have built up trust equity in the church and with the pastor so that they can go to bat for your ministry and the times that you need someone to go to bat for you. You know what I mean? Um, now, I know there are, let's just be honest, I know there's some curmudgeons that you don't want anywhere near your students. You know who they are, but that's not the vast majority of them. The vast majority, they love their grandkids, and they're going to see those teenagers and college students and, and preteens as their grandkids. And hey, listen, some of our most favorite people in our lives and in the world are our grandparents. Use them. That is an untapped resources for the next generation ministry. All right, cool. So throwing that out there, any thoughts or comments about that? What are some ways that you practically um, engage the older in a congregation to the younger? So like taking those two worlds and how do you facilitate those two age differences? 
Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. So, gosh, I think, you know, it's the word that we love to use a lot um, at NAM and stuff. It's almost like structured organic, right? Structured organic, meaning this, you provide the atmosphere for them to connect and then let the relationships organically happen. Um, and so what I typically, uh, like what I would do as a student pastor um, is I would go into those Sunday school classes. I'd have somebody else teach or write, or you do the main and then however your setup is, maybe you do the main teach and then they all go to their Sunday school classes or small groups or whatever. And then I would set up a time with those leaders and say, hey, can I come in and just share with you our heart for student ministry, our heart for the children's ministry, our vision, what we're doing, and then uh, share about opportunities for you to be involved. Man, so you almost go on a recruiting, <laughs> you go after some recruiting, and then provide, say, hey, hey, maybe the first thing you do is maybe come to, uh, would you commit to come in for a month to our Wednesday night gathering? Or would you commit to come into six weeks uh, to this? Or, hey, we have this event coming up, would you come and help serve food at it? Um, and then just watch those organic relations take place. So that's what I mean by structure. You provide the landing ground for it to take place. And then I would let the relationships organically, you know, happen. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Cool. Yeah. Any other thoughts on the Aegis mindset? And I think a lot of reasons why this even connects more with Generation Z is because the breakdown of the family, so many of Generation Z right now are being raised by their grandparents or they're spending a lot of time with their grandparents. Um, so that's who they're identifying with. Um, and also some of it too is, uh, we can discuss this more down the road, is that um, a lot of Generation Z, if you think about it, are being raised by millennials or young Gen Xers. And even those, those relations aren't far removed. Generation Z is extremely, and you've probably already seen it if you've been working, they're extremely different than millennials, extremely different than young Gen Xers and their mindset, yeah. Um, in fact, some would say it's almost like cyclical to where some of the mindset of what the baby boomers thought, how they perceived the world when they were younger is very similar to how Generation Z perceives the world now. Um, and so there's kind of some natural connections there, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's move on to the next one real quick for time's sake. Um, we'll talk more about that down the road for time. Let's move over that. Um, yeah. Let's talk about this one just real briefly. I think this is self-explanatory. The next generation largely values the why over the what. Let me just throw this out there. Um, I think this is the easiest way to explain. Um, teenagers, college students, young adults, preteeners. Uh, let me just give one example because probably most of us um, have a, a Southern Baptist background or we serve in a Baptist church. I serve with the, the Southern Baptist Convention, the denomination. That's who I serve with and, um, and, and who uh, pays my bills. All right. Um, the next generation is not going to be Baptist just because their parents were or grandparents were. The next generation um, is not even going to be Christian just because their parents or grandparents were. Um, if we cannot answer their why questions, we'll lose them or if we can't be honest about what we don't know, we'll lose them. Meaning this, if they ask why and we don't know, be honest and say, I don't know. Like, I think when we try to say, well, just because, that's not an answer. Meaning this, you know, like, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, as a parent, I'm a father of five. You know, we have five kids that are 14 and another. That's a prayer request, by the way. But there's so many things that I say now as a dad that my dad said to me that I swore I would never say, you know. But one of them is this, because I'm the dad, right? You know, they go, why? Because I'm the dad, all right? So I say those things. But what I'm saying is if we take that same approach in the church of going, uh, and they say, hey, why do we do that? And we just go, because that's the way it is, or that's the way we've always done it. And we're not really explaining um, that that repels a generation. And if, I, if we can be honest, I think this is a safe place to be honest. Sometimes the reason we don't like those why questions is because we don't know the why ourselves, right? We're just, it's something that's been done or we're forced to do it or it's an expectation on us. So I think we have to understand and be able to communicate the why questions. And let me say this too, we need to be able to respond in kindness and patience and understanding. Um, 
if I'll be honest, sometimes as the local church uh, or the body of Christ, uh, we are not good at responding to those why questions because we almost get offended by them, right? And we take them personal and we respond in anger. And I think that repels a generation too. Um, and so it take, we need to explain uh, the why. Uh, also in this, let me say this too, Generation Z is the least religious generation we've ever seen. Meaning this, now that they're in high school and college, there's a lot more data that's come out. Um, last fall, Wall Street Journal put out a very eye-opening poll. And the poll said this, less than 30% of Generation Z says religion is important to them. Now hear me, not even Christianity, just religion at all. So less than 30% says religion is even important to them. If that be true, they truly are the least religious generation we've ever seen in US history, all right? So when we're explaining and teaching and speaking, we, we need to be careful about all the religious jargon we use. Uh, I remember when I was a Criswell student, I took Dr. Street's uh, personal evangelism class and we had to give our personal testimony and he would not allow us to use any religious jargon. Anytime we did, he'd stop us. We'd have to pull it out. Meaning this like, hey, we can teach principles of justification, redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, but we just, we have to explain them all. In fact, those are big fancy words. We even need to explain, if we're gonna use the word grace, we gotta explain it. If we're gonna use the word mercy, we gotta explain it. Meaning this, you see now a truly post-Christian generation that is a result of a post-Christian culture. I know it's hard for us to wrap our mind around that in the South, but it's even happening and changing in the South. So like, even when you're preaching and teaching and you go, hey, uh, remember the story of David and Goliath? Chances are they may say no, right? Because fewer and fewer teenagers have grown up in the church. Fewer and fewer young adults, fewer and fewer college students. And it's going to be more and more so that way. So meaning this, it's an opportunity for us to truly teach God's word, Genesis through Revelation, and explain it all. Um, I'll tell you this, just in my own story, in my own journey. Uh, whenever I was in Bible college and fresh out of Bible college and seminary, as a preacher, as a communicator, I felt the pressure to use these $10 fancy words because if I'll be honest, I wanted to impress everybody with how smart I was. The older I get in ministry, the more experience I have in ministry, I truly found the most um, intellectual people have a unique ability to explain deep theological truths in a way that the sixth grader in the room can understand. So I want you to think through that of how I'm explaining like, to me, that's true wisdom. To me, that's true uh, ways to, to show your intellect is when you're able to explain deep, deep eternal theological truths in a way that the 13 year old in the room can understand. So anyway, yeah, that's a quick one. Just throw that out there. Yeah, any thoughts on that or comments? Is, is this something, um, so when you, when you say, you know, they, they value the why over the what, um, is this something that you incorporate pretty um, heavily in your preaching and teaching ministry? Yeah, yeah, and, man. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, so I've started asking more questions in like how I build a sermon. You know, used to, I just wanted to make these kind of like truth bombs, truth statements. Now I'm asking questions and even it's even way that, you know, the way that I read the Bible is even differently. You know, like there's right, there's two ways to read the Bible where you try to see yourself in every story. You're the hero of every story. Um, or you read the Bible in a way that God is the hero of every story, you know? And so I started asking my question self is like, okay, like what was the original? I mean, these are all things we learn in hermeneutics, right? What was the original intent of the author? That's a question. Uh, what did what did God want people to know and the Holy Spirit want people to know 2000 years ago? I think explaining that like this is here's the context of 2000 years ago and then being able to answer the question like what does that mean today? And then I always ask these two questions of myself and this is even in like journaling and personal Bible studies like what does God want me to know about him from this text? And then what is God calling me to do from this text? You know, and I think just answering those questions, man, and even building your sermons like that will just naturally connect more. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's move on to the next one real quick. Um, yeah, here's a good one uh, for time's sake. Uh, 
Generation Z did not want to be seen as the future of the church. Now, let me explain what I mean by this, because we say this all the time, right? We always tell them, hey, you're the future of the church. You're the future of the church. And I know what we mean by that. Usually when we say, hey, you're the future of the church, what we mean is like, hey, you're the future leaders. You're the future influencers. This is important. Do the work now. Be disciple now. Be, you know, uh, take some time to learn now. Um, and yes, on some levels, they're the future of the church. But let me talk theologically about this. Like, according to the New Testament, if you've been bought by the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you, you're not the future of the church. You're the church right now. You have a calling now. You have the great commission on your life now, the great commandment on your life now. You are the church right now. So that means, hey, our friend that works for preteeners, that 10-year-old who's been truly born again, they are the church right now. That 16-year-old, that 20-year-old, that 13-year-old are the church right now. And if you think about it, sadly, I think other organizations outside the bride of Christ understand this more than we do, unfortunately, meaning this, like, think about it. There's 14 year olds that are creating their own brands right now. Did you realize today, according to statistics, there's more millionaire teenagers alive today in the United States than at any point in U.S. history? primarily because of YouTube and TikTok. They're innovators. They're creators of their own brands, right? Uh, the, you know, the 16-year-old is operating a motor vehicle, driving down, you know, I-30. I mean, how crazy is that? You know, the 17-year-old is in the workforce. Think about this. The 18-year-old's holding an automatic weapon around the world, protecting our freedoms. And then as the church, we say, nah, you're not ready. You need to uh, be seen and not heard. Listen, if we have that mindset towards the next generation of you need to be seen and not heard, they won't be seen. They won't be heard because they won't be around. Uh, one thing about Generation Z is they don't want to be spectators. They want to be participants. You know, in fact, I think that's why so many student ministries are struggling right now with digital. But we think, well, they're digital natives. This should be easy. Well, they don't want to just sit and spectate. Even when they're online, they're active and participating. Right. They're playing video games. They're liking. They're commenting. They're sharing. Uh, they're talking to their friends, right? So how do we mobilize the church to be the church? Meaning this, how do we help the next generation realize they're the church of the day? Meaning this, hey, if all those things can be done when they're teenagers, then they can serve the bride of Christ. Um, I would say this, typically we go, well, a generation's not ready. I would say this, um, I think it's proved that we don't have a generation problem. We have a discipleship problem in our church. Um, also, I'd say this, like, they're going to mess up. So, like, empower them to serve, empower them to be the hands and feet of Jesus, but also give them a safety net of grace, knowing that they will fail, they will fall on their face, they will mess up, they may not do it near as good as you. But aren't you glad that people operate in grace towards us? Anybody still make mistakes, even as a leader? Anybody else make mistakes and mess up? Right? So, we got to find ways to serve. In fact, one of my favorite situations to walk into is when you walk up, uh, when I walk up to a local church on a Saturday or Sunday to preach, and there's the 15-year-old uh, greeting next to the 60-year-old at the same door, handing out bulletins, greeting and serving together. Um, the next generation want to be seen as the church right now. So let's empower them to do that. And I would encourage you with this. I think this also adds some sticking power to where um, I think teenagers will stay connected to the local church after they graduate out of student ministry if they've already been serving in the local church, meaning this, right? There's that statistic that we all hate, that, you know, the 70 or the 85 or the 62, whatever statistic you read, drop out of, you know, drop out of the church uh, after student ministry. Um, and then they may come back. They may not. Some percentages do come back. Some never do. Um, I think one of the best ways to build a bridge is when they're already serving the local church as a whole. It's just an easier transition. In fact, I would say this too. Um, don't just have them serving in the student ministry. Have them serving in the church at large um, because when we run our student ministries or children's ministry like a church within a church, then whenever they graduate out of the student ministry and they enter, we used to call it big church, right? When they enter big church, it's almost like they're having to join a new church because it's a whole different culture. It's people they don't know. And so when we're running our student ministry, like a church within a church and then students graduate, it's almost like they're having to go join a new church that they don't know anything about. 
Like our student ministry should just be a part of the body of bride of Christ. And so how do we have our students mobilized to serve the church as a whole? Yeah. So just throw that one out there. Yeah. Any thoughts or comments or questions about that one? One of the things uh, that we've seen take off in our student ministry is we do day th through all of this COVID time, we've done daily devotions on our Instagram and we've turned that over to our uh, student leadership team to Love do it. a couple of them. And one of the biggest stress pieces uh, for some of our team on, in the student ministry has been, well, what if they say something wrong? <laughs> Let them take ownership. And, and we've seen, the viewership go up so yep. like five to six fold um, yep. on the days that the students take it over versus myself and the girls minister take it over. I love that, man. That is so good. And Hey, uh, I want you to know that's a commonality across the board. Uh, student ministries and churches that are using uh, their students to do those devotionals and share the testimonies. Same thing has gone way up. You know, it's kind of like I shared a while ago about my own personal teenager. Like when she sees something from one of her youth pastors, because we're a multi-campus church, she's like, oh, that's good. But then when she sees it from one of her friends, it grabs her attention. Like it cuts through the white noise of social media. Man, that's awesome, brother. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I love that, Drew. That's, that's so encouraging. Um, so how do you have them send you like a pre-devotion and you kind of just say, hey, um, that, that, that was a really good stab at it, but like the Bible actually doesn't say that. Like how do you... How do you address, I guess, I mean, even Drew and Shane, how do you, how do you address um, maybe some doctrinal errors or, 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 you know, totally misinterpreting that scripture? And, you know, you say it in love and you're kind and you're understanding, uh, but you also want to give them another shot. Yeah. Drew, what do y'all do? Uh, through, through COVID, uh, he reads truth and she reads truth app has given church uh, subscriptions away for free and so what we did is we've got a church subscription it's for for our size church I, th I think it's just one size fits all i think uh, but it's like 70 dollars a month and so uh but during this free time we just ask all of our students hey sign up to do uh, a, a certain series that we're doing we're wrapping up this is the gospel um, their devotion on that and so we map it out and we know what day every devotion's on. And then we just pitch it to them and say, Hey, would you do the one that's on? I mean, we gave the resurrection, the death, burial and resurrection away to a high school senior and said, Hey, will you take it? And our girls minister met with her, um, asked her to read it, go through it several days in advance, do a recording, walk through it. And just kind of like you're asking, yeah, Hey, Hey, you said you didn't say, the gospel you said a gospel not that that's a like huge but let's make sure to change that and i mean they're no longer than two minutes uh, we're not asking them to do mm -hmm. 25 minutes we're asking for two minutes or less yeah yeah that's good Drew. yeah i would echo that same thing is uh yeah obviously you want to keep them short and then yeah i always i would have them submit them ahead of time so you can look over and then you know affirm go back and go man this was so brave of you to do this um but hey here's what you said here let me encourage you and, and like help you in this and maybe hey would you re-record it now that you have learned this or understood this you know yeah 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 i would definitely send those in ahead of time yeah Awesome. So good. All right. Let me share uh, uh, one more, like maybe big picture thing, and then we can do some discussion. And like I said, I want to honor your time. Hey, John, just for clarity, is this supposed to be a total of one hour? Is that right? Yeah. So uh, we usually go till about uh, 1130. Um, okay, perfect. If you guys want to stay on. I know that uh, myself and, and my team here, uh, our, our Criswell team here, we're going to be on for a little bit after if anybody has questions okay. or want to talk. So. Cool. Sounds good, man. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I have some time after this as well, so we can continue as long as you want, but I want to honor everyone's time. So we'll maybe we can make a hard break at that 1130 and then uh, we can have some discussion afterward for those that want to stay on. Okay, cool. All right. Let me share this one because I think this is important. This is going to be relevant to us all. Uh, Gen Z wants authenticity and transparency. Now I want to combine that with another one and then we can discuss uh, Generation Z knows brokenness at an earlier age. All right. So because of the internet, 
uh, Generation Z is exposed to things at a lot earlier age than even we were. And you may go, well, I'm not that far removed. Um, think about it, man. Their whole life has been online. And whether it's stuff they searched out or things that just came on a screen as they were innocently watching other things, they're exposed to things as preteens, you know, and junior high. Uh, you know, I remember, you know, um, you know, talking about pornography to junior hires and, and, you know, parents freaking out going, oh, they're too young. According to Barna, the first exposure to internet pornography now uh, is around the age of 10. Um, and so when the church is silent and the world is screaming, where do you think they're going to go, right? Because the church is silent on it. So meaning this is like, we need to address the things that are broken in this world and to understand the students can handle it. Now, I'm not talking about being vulgar. I'm not talking about being overboard, but I'm talking about we need to realize what they are struggling with um, and what they're being exposed to. And especially think right now in this time of isolation, isolation is like fuel to any struggle. Isolation is like steroids to any temptation, right? So when your students are already struggling with lust uh, or depression or anxiety or other addictions or they're in rough family situation, please know these last two months, three months have been like steroids to that, um, has been like a fuel to that. So we must be authentic and transparent about what they're going through and then give them a safe space for them to be authentic and transparent. Um, now, let me, let me talk about a little bit of that. Let's hone in on one that I think is the hot topic and we all struggle with and we all, uh, and, and what I mean in, in ministry, uh, we are ministering to people who struggle with this and we may struggle ourselves. Um, so, in my generation, and a lot of the generation I see kind of as I'm seeing videos here and pictures here, uh, remember like when we were younger, like teenagers and college students, we used to self-diagnose ourselves with ADD or ADHD. You know, whether we really had it or not, we all thought we did. And we would even say things, you know, like some of us really were diagnosed with it, but I'm saying like we all thought we had it. So whether we ever went to a doctor or not, or whether we were ever prescribed something or not, we'd say things like, oh, my ADD is kicking up or, or my ADDDD is kicking in. That's why, please know like your students that you're ministering to right now, whether it's college students, young adults, teenagers, preteen, uh, are doing the exact same thing we did, but they're doing it with depression and anxiety. Meaning this, like they all think they're depressed. They all think they're anxious. Uh, some of them really are. Some are clinically diagnosed with that, but all think they are, and a lot of self-diagnosing has taken place. Um, we know there are kind of some, some herd mentalities, right, where when everyone is saying they're depressed and anxious, and then they're telling you that you're probably anxious and depressed, like, you're going to believe that. Here's the deal. Some really are. Let me say that. Some are. Now, some may have a about. Uh, a temporary bout with sadness and blues and depression. Some may have a, a temporary bout with anxious feelings. I think we can all have anxious feelings, but that doesn't necessarily mean that is your identity and how you're defined. So let me throw this out there. I think every student ministry, every young adult ministry, probably even preteens in their discipleship process needs to make a part of their discipleship journey, how to have healthy views of emotions in light of the gospel meaning this the next generation is a emotionally charged generation and we need to make sure that we're able to have a healthy view of it meaning number one like like we understand theologically god's common grace sometimes the church we are not very good with mental illnesses meaning this right like what is always our prescription if someone is struggling with mental illness, right? You're like, oh, you need to read your Bible more. You need to pray more. And yes, those all things are true. But we also need to see it as like if God uses therapists and Christian counselors and maybe medicine for a short time or whatever, if God uses those things, he's still getting the glory. Common grace. All God, truth is God's truth. He still gets the glory of that, right? We wouldn't you know, I didn't think uh, in my hand, a lot of people don't know this. I actually have a metal plate in my hand that holds my hand together because I crush my hand 
uh, playing church slow pitch softball. All right? I wish I had a better story, like I punched a bear or something, but it was church league slow pitch softball. All right? But I crushed my hand. It was broken in five places, literally had a bone sticking out of my hand, as gross as that sounds. Like, what if I said, all right, I got a broken hand. And then somebody goes, you know what you should do? Read your Bible more. You know, you should pray more. Like, that doesn't help. Like, I needed this, a surgeon. I needed a doctor. I needed medicine, right? But God still gets the glory when he uses human instruments. So that's one form of it, all right? Another form is this, is that we need to just stop, I think, validating that people are struggling and also in our validation offer victory the gospel brings victory here's why i want to say this i think this is extremely relevant what is a popular cliche that we say all the time right now even in the church especially a young young adults and teenagers is we'll say this it's okay to what you can probably fill in the blank what is it it's okay to what not be okay right it's okay to not be okay and that's true, but please hear me. That is not an, a landing place. That's a beginning place. Like, it's okay to not be okay, meaning like you need a, a place where you can admit you're struggling. You can admit your suffering. You can admit your, your failures and your sin. It's okay to not be okay, but please hear me. It ain't okay to stay that way when there's another way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And what I mean by that, especially I see it when I'm, you know, speaking to college students and high school students, especially high school and college students, is like, man, praise God how transparent and authentic high school and college students are. But what I've found is if we're not careful, we're just, we're just confessing the same sin over and over, week after week, month after month, year after year. And you're going, hey, I appreciate your authenticity talking about how much you struggle with porn and you fail to porn and you watch this. And we just validate that week after week, month after month, year after year. Listen, that the gospel goes further than that, right? So it's okay to not be okay, but the gospel goes further than that statement. The gospel brings freedom and victory. And yes, you may have moments where you fall on your face, but the grace of God picks you up. The power of the Holy Spirit in us is like shaping us daily to live more like Christ, to have those holy lives, to look different. And we may say, you know what? I'm not who I want to be yet, but praise God, I'm not who I was yesterday. Like we need to make sure we're pushing that envelope because I see it hugely in the church right now. It's okay to not be okay. Yes, but the gospel goes further than that. That's a starting place. That is not the end landing place. Um, same thing with safe spaces. That's a popular word right now, safe space. We need safe spaces. I would, I would push it a little past that and go, we need brave spaces, meaning this. We want spaces where you're brave enough to share your struggles, your temptations, your weakness, your depression, your anxiety, your, your lust, your, your addictions. We need a brave space where you're brave enough to confess that, and we're brave enough to receive that in a healthy, mature way, but we need a brave space to say, hey, but we want you to be brave enough, you know, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life, to walk in victory and freedom and holiness, that we would be holy because God is holy and he's called us to that. So I would say safe spaces. Uh, I understand the mindset of that, but I think we even need to change our definition and say we need brave spaces where we're brave enough to confess but we're also brave enough to allow the gospel to work in our life to change us over time. Um, so there's, I mean, that's a lot, but I think it's super relevant to where we are right now as a church and how we're ministering to the next generation. Uh, we'd love some, some thoughts and comments on that. I know that you're probably all dealing with that in your ministries. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate the distinction between uh, safe space and uh, brave space um, and just calling our students to more um, mm -hmm. in victory in Christ. I just really love that. One of our, uh, we use orange. Um, yeah. Um, and so the second lead small principle is create a safe place. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to coin your term if you're okay with it, <laughs> uh, just to take them a little bit further uh, from safe place to brave space. That's really good. Because awesome, it just man. cripples yeah. us in our in our sin and and um, this 
rather than gives us hope and the victory that we can have in Christ. But yeah. I get why they have that terminology. For yeah, of course. Ministry safe purposes and, yep. um, you know, child abuse and all those, you know, horrible things that are out there. Um, but words really matter. And so yeah. we challenge them the more. That's, that's great. I appreciate that distinction. Hey, thanks, Matt. Yeah, and man, I understand the safe place too and the authenticity, transparency side, because if we can be honest, uh, the church hasn't been the best place for that to happen in the past. In fact, I think that's where, you know, uh, our neighbor uh, in our area, you know, Matt Chandler, I think coined it the best is that Christians are sometimes the best liars because we just always say we're fine, even when we're not fine. But we don't want to say that at church because then we feel like people are going to gossip about us or view us differently or treat us or sit us, you know. Um, and so we just lie instead of being honest. And so, so I love the mindset of it's okay to not be okay, the safe spaces. But I think the in light of the gospel, those, those things are starting places, not ending places, where I think the church has kind of fell in a season where we kind of end there. Like, that's it, you know. And I think if we're just walking in the same sin, month after month, year after year, and confessing it, hey, praise God, we're confessing it, but we're confessing the same junk forever, then is there really victory of, of the gospel in our life? You know, yeah. So I'd have a question about yeah. students um, who are hard to engage in that, in that conversation. Not they're, they're not on the confession side, but they're on the, the side of, you know, being in front of their computer most of the day, especially right now in yeah. being at home. Um, how do you approach that topic with, with those students that kind of either don't want to talk about it or they're like, no, that's not really me, but just kind of the inevitability of the internet and even just mm -hmm. online games and what you hear and yeah. let alone what you see. And so like, how do you approach the, the, um, the student that's maybe a little bit pushed back on, on that topic? Yeah, great. Uh, Jesse, right? Is that your name, Jesse? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, Jesse, incredible question. I think as leaders, the best thing we can do is cultivate an environment for to where that is okay to talk about and normal to talk about. You know what I mean? Where we cultivate an environment where we truly are carrying one another's burdens. And so people feel at liberty to be able to share and be honest about what they're struggling about. Because I don't think we can force people into it or push people into it or drag it out of them. Um, you know, I think we cultivate an environment where that is okay to take place and it's spirit led. Um, I would say the other side of that too is uh, one of the things I wish I'd have done. And, and then part two, we'll talk more about this. So we're going to, this is really a part one and part two, part two next week, we'll drill down on a lot of these. And I want to share some more things about the way we can approach our summer. Uh, so same place, same time next week. That's kind of a, a commercial. Um, but uh, how do we get our parents and legal guardians involved more in our ministry? Uh, because the best way that's going to happen is by being teammates with the parents. Uh, because think about it, at the most, you have them an hour a week, two hours a week, three hours a week. And if they go home and their parents are okay with them being in their rooms with the doors locked, sitting on the internet all day, uh, there's probably very little you can say that will uh, be able to to overcome that hill. You know what I mean? It's got to be a work of the Holy Spirit, but man, it helps when we can teammate, team up with our parents and legal guardians. And so we can uh, drive in on that a little more next week. In fact, it, when people say, hey, Shane, if you could go back and be a college pastor or a student pastor, a uh, next gen pastor in the local church, what would you do differently? And here's what I'd do differently. I would almost split my time in half where half my time would be focused on the students themselves. And the other half of my time would be focused on discipling, equipping, empowering, and mobilizing their parents, legal guardians, or whoever they're living with. Um, because here's the deal. Like I said, we have such a little time with them. And if we can equip and empower those who they're going home to, uh, that's only going to be a help, right? And at the end of the day, according to the family structure biblically, uh, the parents and legal guardians are should be the primary disciple makers. They are, they're primary, they're their kids' uh, primary pastor, not us. So at the end of the day, when they go to church in a perfect setting, I know it's not always perfect. When they're going to church or they're going to your student ministry, it should just be affirmation of the things they're already living 
happening and experiencing and hearing at home. Now, I know that's in a perfect setting. It doesn't always work like that. In fact, as a student pastor, especially on Wednesday nights, uh, I had a, the majority of my student ministry is what I called, uh, for lack of a better term, church orphans, meaning they came to church, but their parents didn't, or their parents would drop them off, or they would walk, and the parents had nothing to do with the local church, uh, but those teenagers did, you know. So how do we get better at equipping the parents who are involved in our churches and are involved in their kids' life? Um, because that's only going to help uh, in their long-term health, and it's only going to help our ministries, you know. Uh, but we can talk more about that next week. But that's a great question, man. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, well, I see it is 1136. I want to honor everybody's time. I, hey, I'll stay on for, I can stay on for about another uh, 20 minutes or so. So I'd love to stay on, discuss more, talk more. But I do want to honor people's time. So those of you that need to go, I do want to share this with you as some free resources. Um, the first thing is, is I've written a 30-day devotional uh, for NAM that is absolutely free. Uh, for next-gen leaders and for teenagers, um, all towards evangelism, helping teenagers live their life evangelistically um, by uh, identifying a lost person in their life, investing in them, um, uh, praying for them, and being able to share the gospel with them. So every day tells you what to read in the Bible. Uh, so it's read, pray, act. So every day tells you what to read in the Bible, gives some paragraphs to help think about that, a specific prayer for the spiritually lost that day, and then a action or a challenge for that day to live evangelistically, and each day is very specific. Um, that will release June 1st. You can find that and download that uh, at HoosierOne.com on June 1st, but if you would like to see a preview of it right now, if you text the word devotional to 888-111, you can see a preview of it on your phone or your tablet uh, by texting devotional to 888-111. And then the second thing I want to tell you about is a podcast that I've launched with NAM uh, that launched about four weeks ago. It's called Next Gen on Mission. And uh, we released 10 episodes. Uh, we're doing almost like a series model where we'll do a whole season, release it at one time, and then down the road, release another season of, say, 15 episodes. But there's already 10 episodes up. You can find that on Apple Music, Spotify, your favorite podcast host. And basically, I just have a conversation with a leader. Um, from, you know, 20 to 25 minutes, all about reaching, discipling, and mobilizing uh, the next generation. Um, it's also something for the next generation themselves. So each conversation will have some questions or some thoughts that are geared towards next-gen leaders and parents, but then there will be some two or three questions geared towards the next generation themselves. So it's really a resource for you, your parents, uh, your students, um, and absolutely free called Next Gen Mission. This first season is uh, some conversations uh, between me and J.D. Greer, uh, Ben Trueblood, uh, Madeline Carroll. She is the actress, and I can only imagine she played Bart's girlfriend. Uh, Jeff Wallace of Student, Student Leadership University, D.A. Horton and his wife. Um, gosh, uh, Greg Steer, Clayton King. Uh, it's just a great episode, a uh, great season. For season two, we've already recorded, started recording that. We'll drop that probably in September. Uh, but those will be conversations with like Jenny Allen and, and uh, Jen Wilkin and Benjamin Watson and Carrie Newhoff and just so many others. And there are also conversations with pastors and student pastors who are actually on the front lines doing it. So anyway, I want you to uh, take advantage of those. Those are some free resources for you. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shane, uh, for that. And uh, so just to let y'all know, uh, we are going to stay on just for, for a little bit. Um, so if, if you don't have to go, then uh, we'd love for you to stick around. But uh, I know that uh, this is a busy time. So uh, there is a question in the chat that I wanted to bring up right here from Drew. Um, what is one resource that you would recommend, uh, uh, recommend to us to get our hands on for ministering uh, about mental health uh, to share with families. Um, so Shane, I'll, I'll let you answer that. Um, real quick, I will say we have had a couple of our uh, our professors here at Criswell who uh, who are who are teaching our psych and counseling uh, uh, courses and uh, degrees. Um, and so I will be putting those videos up on YouTube very soon. Uh, I'll make sure to get those available um, to you, Drew, and I, I believe I have uh, some contact information to you, so I can get that to you. And then uh, Shane, I don't know if you want to.
I think you're muted, Shane. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> hey, noob, noob rookie oh, there mistake, we go. man. What a rookie <laughs> mistake. That's a noob mistake. Uh, yeah, so uh, Emotionally Healthy Leaders is a great book. It's geared towards leaders, but there are some great principles in there that flows down to, to every age and, and uh, every walk. Um, that's a great resource. Also, uh, Jenny Allen's new book is really good. If you are familiar with Jenny Allen of the If Gathering, uh, she has a new book called Get Out of Your Head. And that's all about that too. Just kind of really, uh, you know, not in all, not self-help, not new agey, but that kind of just self negative talk that we tell ourselves and self-criticism and, and honest, you know, kind of that principle, but besides Satan, often our greatest enemy is ourself, you know? Um, and so that's a, a great resource. What I was saying uh, when I was muted is um, there are some great resources already out, but I think it's just such a topic that's come to light even more and more so that I think you'll see more and more resources come out soon. Um, but yeah. Uh, and I echo yeah what John said about what Criswell is putting out from some of their teachers and professors has been, yeah, really, really good. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, just gosh, in the last eight months, you know, three high profile pastors and leaders, um, you know, uh, taking their own life. And uh, I knew all three of them, two of them closely, you know, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, man, uh, leaders are not, um, gosh, pro even protected from this. Um, and so that's the one thing I would want to encourage those of you that are still on here as leaders is you're constantly pouring out, pouring out. So make sure people are pouring into you. And in fact, I, uh, I'll get into this a little bit next week when we regather again, but uh, hey, here's an opportunity approaching this summer for solitude. Um, you know, I heard this two years ago and it just came so relevant here recently of uh, the solitude and isolation are two different things. Solitude is intentional time with the Lord and scripture and prayer and meditation that grows you spiritually. Isolation is unintentional time by yourself where usually sin grows. So here's a great opportunity for solitude. Be intentional with it. Spend time with the Lord and prayer, scripture reading, meditation. Be intentional to spend some, some solitude with those people who are most important in your life um, and then lead from that overflow. I don't know about y'all, but I know for me, I'm a lot more effective leader when I'm doing it out of the overflow of my own worship of Jesus. So I would just encourage you lead, teach, follow, serve, preach, share, disciple out of the overflow of your own worship of Jesus. I think we're so good at pouring out and giving, and we're really bad at getting poured into, and we're really bad at receiving. Um, and then we just run on empty. So what happens? Moral failures. Uh, we become a shell of a leader just going through the motions or the worst case scenarios, you know, that we've seen lately. And so, yeah. I've got a question. Um, so what, like in, there's, I feel like in my study of Gen Z, there's been a couple of books that have been like kind of groundbreaking and understanding them in sense of like reclaiming conversation or the vanishing adulthood by Ben Sass or amusing ourselves to death by Neil Postman and books like yeah. that. So is there, have there been a work or works that you've encountered that were like, kind of like, wow, like that you get either statistical or kind of a, 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 a broad narrative about Gen Z that you've encountered. And then secondly, yeah. um, I find it difficult sometimes to refer younger people to something um, yep. just because there is kind of, it's harder to get their attention onto reading something um, mm -hmm. that is longer than, uh, you know, maybe uh, 50 pages or something like that. So, yeah. um, and I've, I, I write devotionals for my students and so, yep. but, uh, in the sense of like reading or listening to there's things that you particularly refer them to. Yeah, man, that's good. Uh, yeah. John just put in there amusing ourselves to death. Is a, it is a fantastic book. Mm -hmm. um, there's another book that's been recommended me by a couple of dozen people that I just bought that I have not read yet that I think, uh, but it's called, um, I think John Piper wrote the Ford. He is not the author. I don't remember who the author is, but it's basically, uh, like ways that your uh, cell phone is changing you. Um, so I'm excited to dive into that. Um, also, um, Tim Elmore stuff is really good. Are you familiar with Tim Elmore? I learned so much from him. No. Like when it comes to the next generation, yeah, just write his name down, Tim Elmore. In fact, he's just done so much study in light of the gospel of 
of cultural effects, uh, even the effects of our electronics and phone. In fact, I mean, you know, he, his team did a lot of the work to even find, you know, we were talking about depression and anxiety a while ago. Of like, there's a di direct correlation between screen time and anxious feelings. Um, so, I mean, you think about like when the next generation just constantly on screens and that just drives up anxiety, you know? Um, and so those are probably more for you and your leaders. Uh, for the next generation themselves, you know, a lot of times what you can do is, is maybe you have their ear. Um, and so take those principles that you're learning and then put them in your words that's relevant for their context. Um, I think sometimes what we need to do too, especially if it's online, is we go, well, they're online all day or they're binge watching this. Um, like, yeah, but they're binge watching like bite-sized segments, right? They're binge watching YouTube videos that are two and three minutes long, four minutes long. They're not binge watching a lot of 30 minute sermons, you know what I mean? So is there even some content that maybe you can put out that you're learning from these things for them? It's in your voice, it's relevant, but you're putting out two to three minute videos, a minute or less, you know, TikTok and those kind of things. So you think about it, their, their mind is being conditioned. Yes, they're online all day, but they're just seeing, seeing one minute video after one minute video, two minute video, three minute video, you know? Um, in fact, I, I even know some leaders um, that are taking this time, even with their online services for students to go, okay, hey, yeah, I normally preach 25, 30 minutes. Well, 25 or 30 minutes on a video seems really, really long, especially when you cannot control the atmosphere of the other side of that screen, right? Because there's, they probably got other devices going, their siblings are running in and out of the room. So they're saying, hey, what if I take the same content and instead of one 30 minute video, it's 10 three minute videos or three 10 minute, you know, uh, or 10, you know, or five, five minutes, you know what I mean? And they're putting in same content, same well, still same meat, but they're putting in more of the bite size uh, chunks, you know, but yeah, Tim Elmore, uh, probably my favorite book so far on like generation Z has been called, I think it's called meat generation Z uh, by James Emery white. That one's a really good too. And my favorite, my, the whole book's good, but my favorite chapter in there is when he talks about how to communicate with the next generation. And he really gets in with some of that religious jargon stuff. Like this is mind blowing. He was saying like, you know, 20 years ago when we'd speak to young adults, it would almost be like Peter in Acts chapter two, where now when we're speaking to generation Z 20 years later, 30 years later, we're almost, we need to be like Paul in Acts chapter 17. Meaning what Peter, who is he mainly talking to in Acts 2 is talking to the Jews that had a concept of God. They had some concept of, of scripture. And so he's building off of that. Really, when we're communicating Generation Z, a post-Christian generation, we're more like Paul in Acts 17, right? Where he's in Athens and he's pointing out all the cultural things and like, right, where they, they think all gods are the same. So he's pointing that out and then he's preaching the gospel in light of that, but he's explaining everything along the way and i mean when he pointed that out, i was like that's so true you know like 20 years ago 30 years ago there was a biblical basis that we could build upon in most people's life living in a you know quote unquote christian culture or at least a, you know uh, like some version of that but that's totally changed so now we almost got to approach like paul as a missionary in Acts 17 where we got to point out stuff in culture that is hypocrisy or point out things in a culture that is leaving them wanting more and then explain God's truth in a way, almost like they don't have any basis to build on. Like we're teaching them everything, you know? And, and I was who, like, man, that is why, why super eye opening. You know, what was the yeah. author's name on that? Yeah. James Emery white. Yeah. Is that, I saw you uh, nod your head, Drew. Is that the name of it? Is it meet generation Z or meeting generation yeah. Z? What's the name of that? Yeah, it's Meet Generation Z. It's uh. Yeah, did you read that? Did you read all through? Yeah, it? yeah it's helpful. Uh, did you like not, it? I thought it was super. Not cool. all the way through it. I, I'm, I'm yeah. ADD enough. I start three quarters of a book. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it right there. But that's, yeah. It's been very helpful. I've got it on audio too, and just kind of running through it. Uh, that's that one, and then the one you were talking about that they posted it is the twelve. Yeah, that's it. Twelve yeah. ways your phone is changing you. And that, I think that's good for not just Gen Z, but how's it changing us? Mm. So, yeah. And the uh, Tim Elmore, I just got too many books. That's my problem. <laughs> uh, the 
this one just came out in October. Awesome. I think yeah. I think it is. Yeah, and it's got it. it's a it's a really great book. It's it's dense. It's very dense. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. Oh, great. Also, one that our pastors talked about a lot, and he gave me to read is uh, "Faith for Exiles." Yep. Yeah, uh, I just picked that up as well. Yeah, Mark Matlock. And it's five ways. Yeah, yeah, it's five ways the new generation is following Jesus into a digital Babylon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, Jonathan Paluta's books are really helpful too. He's a personal friend. Y'all know JP that was at Watermark and led the, the porch. Uh, he's got a new book um, called Welcoming the Future of the Church. And in there's all about um, like ways to get, you know, the next generation involved in ministry. And then there's a whole chapter that was super helpful of how like um, basically they build messages that connect to generations. So he uses like a formula, a little bit like what we were talking about, John, of like he lays out basically a sermon structure and then, um, build sermons by a answering questions that he knows the next generation is going to be asking about this particular text and how he kind of thinks through that, you know? Um, and then he's got a whole section about the transparency side of, you know, like a lot of times we gloss over or we candy coat things and that's not helpful to a, a generation. And, and I'll get into this more next week, but man, like when we're preaching to the next generation, remember they're living in a broken world that they know is broken. So I encourage you like preach the word and preach it like with boldness and confidence because they can handle it. Um, when, man, when we as next gen ministries often, when we're doing, if we're not careful, these kind of life hack messages or these self-help messages sprinkled with some verses out of context, that's just white noise to the next generation because they hear that junk all the time. That's what they hear at school. That's what they hear from their parents. That's what they hear in culture is this kind of self-help life hack stuff. Um, and so when they come to church and they hear the same thing, it's just white noise. But man, when you're starting to preach a text about like, you know, depravity and, like, hey, you know what? At the end of the day, no matter how many times your mommy tells you you're not that awesome, but let me tell you about a Jesus who is and how he wants you to live a fulfilled life. It's just going to come from somebody outside of self and, and dying to yourself and what that looks like and his, his plan that's exceedingly abundantly better, but you got to get out of your way. It's not about self-help. It's about being saved and, and sanctification, discipleship. Then they're like, wait a minute. I don't, I don't know. I, no one's ever told me that before. Wait a minute. That's opposite of what school says and what culture says. So I think that helps cut through the white noise, you know? So I, I say this, they can handle it. If they can handle pre-cal, they can handle the doctrine and theology. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I uh, we, we've actually had some of, uh, some of their staff, um, uh, do a, do a session for us in the last couple of months, but, um, Cottonwood Creek Baptist Church in Allen. Yep. Yeah. Uh, they are doing some awesome stuff. They have what they actually call it theology class every Sunday. Yeah. Um, and these are, you know, they, they have their interns, they have uh, their, um, some of their youth uh, ministry team teaching, you know, Bible college seminary. We've even had some of our professor, uh, one of our a professor of uh, systematic theology uh, come out and actually speak to them. And it's crazy. Yeah. These kids are hungry for they deep are, things. Man. And when they hear it, yeah, they're yeah. like, oh, this is, this is cool. I didn't know it could be this deep. I thought it was platitudes. And it's not. Yeah. It's oh, it's great. Yeah. It's, it's, I agree with you, John, 100%. In fact, one of the most popular things, especially with like, I would say high school students and college students, you know, once they get a little older, I would say junior high too, but is like apologetics like because they're so sick of hearing that all religions are the same that all paths lead to god that all got you know what i mean and this kind of like we almost take this participation trophy mentality towards religions too they all get a trophy you know what i mean and they're so sick of that uh in fact uh right before all this pandemic kind of hit at the end of or the first saturday in, in march uh obu oklahoma baptist university put on an apologetics conference for college students and high school students. And they were like, man, 200 would be a win. And they ended up having over 700. And these students were like so hungry 
for ways to defend their faith and prove God and what's the differences between religion. And then uh, they had me come teach four breakouts over my book, Nine Commonalized Christians Believe. And they were like, yeah, like, how do I approach this topic that I hear all the time of follow my heart? What does the Bible have to say about that? Or believe in yourself or God just wants me to be happy. You know what I mean? And they want to navigate through that. And uh, I agree with you, man. Like it is that theology, doctrine, apologetics. Yeah. I almost like, man, they're worn out on this kind of life pack self, self-help stuff. You know, yeah, they, get, they get plenty of that on, uh, on Instagram. And uh, yeah, <laughs> but it's funny. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at the very tail end of millennial, uh, which I, you know, I see a few of us uh, are kind of yeah. in the same boat. Um, but uh, you know, just going on, on Instagram for a long enough time or TikTok, you see, a lot of just how Gen Z thinks and what they yeah. value. And a lot of the yeah. things that you have said here, I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I see a ton of TikTok videos of kids with their grandparents and they love their grandparents. They love making oh, yeah. videos with their yep. grandparents, you know? Yeah. Um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, kids talking about, you know, the things that they're starting, like you said, they're making money, uh, more money than yeah. I'm getting, you know? Uh, but yeah, that's awesome, man. Hey, well, dude, this was good, man. A lot of great feedback. Hey, well, thank you so much, brother. And if you need yeah. anything this week uh, before we get started or anything like that, just let me know. And, uh, yeah, this is fantastic. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Hey, man, and I, dude, like I've said it before, like, hey, I love Criswell, man. I love y'all's team. So even beyond next week, man, I always stand ready to serve you guys in any way you need me and my calendar allows, man. I want to be a part of – what you guys are doing from now on. Yeah. That sounds so great. Staying ready to serve you guys. Well, awesome. Thanks, John. Yep on that. <laughs> All right. Sounds good, brother. Hey, enjoyed it, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Take care, bro. See you next week. Bye. Yes, sir.